All right. Hey, Demetra. Thanks hey, for joining Chris. me today. Yes. All right. So um, what we're going to be talking to, about today is whole sign houses. Um, a few days ago on February 4th, Deborah Holding released this new lecture where she claims that whole sign houses is a modern invention that didn't exist in ancient astrology and also makes some statements about Project Hindsight and things that happened at Project Hindsight. And I wanted to talk to you today to get some of your perspective on that as somebody that was actually around in the 1990s and was there to experience and witness some of what happened mm -hmm. firsthand, because I think some of your recollections are, are different than what was stated in that lecture. Right. That, that's exactly the case. And it's true, we all bring our own perspectives to any event. But I was... Um, startled uh, quite a few times in listening to Deb's presentation with her characterization of what was going on because I remembered something altogether different. And I had spent <clears throat> um, considerable time being present at both uh, the hindsight headquarters and conferences and interactions where all of this was happening. So I thought I just want to bring that those stories and that history to the community and so that there be a record of um, other perspectives of what was going on. Sure. All right. So um, you had a few slides. Let me just share your slide to start this off with some of the main points that you wanted to start with. Okay, we can do that. I actually put those together just to organize my own thinking, but... If the audience will excuse the roughness of some of this, we can certainly share it. Sure. Um, to begin with, I'd like to state my position in my conviction that whole sign houses did exist and were widely used in Hellenistic astrology, as well as traces of the, the practice survived into the Arabic and medieval and Renaissance astrology, and that we have spent um, not only recently some hours, but really years of our lives going over the evidence and reasons and the transmission process and the examples um, in quite extensively. And that you have and will be presenting much of this material. But what I wanted to do with this interview is just share my own observations and experiences concerning the early history of hindsight right. um, and what I saw happen because it was a little bit different than how it's been portrayed. At least yeah. what I saw was different than what I heard being portrayed. Right. And it's like, I've already outlined all the evidence for whole sign houses in mm -hmm. this big 50 page chapter in my book. Yeah. Um, you have used different charts and gone through different evidence and material in, in your book, Ancient Astrology, Volume mm -hmm. 1 and Volume 2. Um, and I have a lecture out where I also like summarized in like three hours or something the book chapter and all the different evidence there are for not just whole sign houses, but the different systems of house division. Because one of the things is both of us have acknowledged that quadrant houses and equal houses existed and were also used in the Hellenistic tradition. Yes, that's absolutely true. There was no point at which any of us, including um, Robert Schmidt and Robert Hand, that denied that other house systems existed. And I thought you did a brilliant job of showing how not only whole sign, but equal and porphyry were all grounded in the earliest of Hellenistic material. So I don't, at least for myself, and I don't think for you, we are not saying that whole sign houses were the only system used. We acknowledge the existence of other systems, but we are contesting that they never existed. Right. We're yeah. contesting the idea that whole sign houses was a modern invention yeah. that there's no evidence for in the text. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, all right. But for the purpose of this, I guess we'll focus primarily on some of your personal experiences, and then maybe we can touch base on some of that other stuff later. Okay. All right. So you wanted to start by first talking about your journey with Hellenistic astrology and whole sign houses in general? 
Uh, yes, and the first thing I wanted to clarify was that there was a statement in this uh, recent recording that um, many well-known American psychological astrologers like Demetra George, myself, very quickly shifted their previous style of practice to this new, wholly different style of Hellenistic astrology. And there I want to correct the record that for me, it was a 10 year, very involved process between first being exposed to whole sign analysis and then fully adopting and teaching them. And in the course of my journey, I first met Robert Zoller and Ellen Black and Robert Schmidt at a house party at an AFA conference in Chicago, and this was in 1992. And Rob, of course, I had heard of and encountered quite often previously in um, through the world of astrological conferences. Rob Hand. Rob Hand. Okay. And they, a year later, um, they first announced Project Hindsight at Norwalk Conference in 1993. And at that point, it was such an inspiring presentation that Robert Hand made, and that because of my um, heritage in ancient Greece and my work in mythology and the asteroids and interests in ancient history, of course, this was something that was close and dear to my heart, and I immediately subscribed to it. Right. You became the first, technically just accidentally, the first right. hindsight <laughs> subscriber. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I found out some months later that that was the case. So mm -hmm. that was symbolic in a certain sort of way of a primary connection with the project and with the teachings. And at this time, I was indeed a modern psychological astrology, very much shaped by the humanistic teachings of Dane Rudyard. Um, I published Asteroid Goddesses and was presenting a very feminist view of astrology. Astrology of Yourself, a beginning text was written, and the two Mysteries of the Dark Moon books were written as well. So I was grounded in the modern psychological feminist tradition. And at that time, and over the next decade, I had first learned the Placidus House system, and then I experimented with the Coke houses. And then after um, becoming friends with Zoller, he encouraged me to look at Alcabitzius houses. And meanwhile, there was this notion of whole sign houses that was being put out there in the community. So I was running charts in all of the different systems. And for periods of time, looking at one system and then the other, and then at a certain point, having multiple house systems of charts in front of me as I was um, doing readings and looking at them with my friends. And so that there is that wide expanse of what's going on here and what seems to correspond best with the experiences and fact that people have had relative to the placements of planets in different houses. And in the early days, you learned how to calculate charts by hand, right? This is pre-computers. Exactly. This is pre-computers. And we use Placidus houses because by and large, that was the only table of houses that was available. And I'm revisiting all of that because I am preparing a course for um, Astrology University in doing math calculations that will be um, available next summer or fall. And so I've gone back into all of that early material of interpolating house cusps and uh, the ways in which the calculations have changed since I first learned them in the 1970s. Right, because you think that like learning how to calculate charts by hand is actually an important thing for students of astrology, and that that's knowledge that you hope isn't lost, um, even though people can use computers today? Um, exactly. And, you know, we know that the ancient astrologers were called the mathematicians, the mathematical. And it was because they were always doing calculations. Now, in the 1970s, I started my studies in 1970. The first thing that you had to do as an astrology student 
was to calculate the chart. And if you couldn't do that, there was no place else to go. You could not become an astrologer. There were no computers, services, or computer courses. And it was almost an initiation of sorts. And to the extent that there's suggestion that astrology is a um, ancient mystery school um, teachings, then learning to calculate the chart is initiation number one in order to be able to enter the practice. And while it's no longer necessary, I think that it's important, especially for all of us who want to support the memory of traditional astrology, the practice of it, the foundation of it, that that essential piece of it we likewise carry forward and pass on. But even beyond that more lofty part, by the time you've done all the calculations and then you've created the chart and set it out, and I remember having blank paper and a protractor and a compass to draw my 12 circle wheel and then put the house cusps in and then put the planets in. I had an embodied connection with the chart. I knew it like inside of me on a deep level before I ever saw the client. And so it's that I'm hoping that current astrologers, whether or not it's unlikely that they'll do all their charts by hand, but for them to have that experience, I think is an awesome thing to be able to say as a traditional astrologer. Yeah, I know this very exhilarating moment. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, so that's the context. So you've tried different systems in the eighties, you have, you're calculating charts by hand. And then in the nineties, um, with project hindsight, they did start to rediscover this notion of whole sign houses, and it did start to come into, um, your awareness and the awareness of other astrologers. Mm -hmm. And even though they were popularizing it, James Holden had already talked about it back in a paper in 1982. And there was another book in 1989. Um, but an AFA book titled Houses, Which and When by Emma Bell Donath, where Holden has a piece where he talks about it. But I get the sense that like it wasn't super well known, even though James Holden was talking about it. And even though he was saying like very explicitly, um, Holden said that it was the original system of house division and that it was the more most popular uh, system. I actually have a paper from James Holden actually I wanted to show. This is um from the AFA um, like newsletter uh, that was published in the year 2000. And it's a little article that James Holden wrote titled The Sign House System of House Division. Um, let me read it really quickly. It says, it starts, it's just the first two paragraphs. It says, during the more than 2000 years that have passed since the invention of horoscopic astrology, Many different systems of house division have been proposed, and a few of them have come into at least some use at one time or another. The system most commonly used today is the Placidian system that was published in the mid-17th century. It has largely replaced the Regiomontanus system that first appeared in 1490. That in turn was replaced by the Alcabitia system, which is named after a 10th century Arabian astrologer, but that actually goes back to the Greek astrologers of the 5th century. So here it gets to the important part. He says, but the original system of house division was what I have called the sign house system. It was devised by the Alexandrian astrologers who invented horoscopic astrology in the second century BCE. It was used by the majority of classical astrologers for half a millennium. It is, its system was very simple. The rising sign, all of it constituted the first house. The next whole sign was the second house, the next whole sign after that, the third house, etc. The tenth whole sign from the ascendant was called the midheaven. There were no cusps in the modern sense of the word, or if you will, the cusp of each house was the first degree of the sign constituting that house. So this is James Holden saying this, and this is similar going back to 1982, and he said other yeah. things in 1989 that he was saying 10 years before Project Hindsight and continued to say throughout his life, just reiterating the same points. Exactly. Um, but so even though despite that, it seems like the AFA wasn't as well known in, in the 80s and 90s to some extent, although you said you attended a conference. So it's like, it does seem like it was when Hand and Schmidt came along that there was 
some greater awareness of Holstein houses, but there must have been some awareness of it sort of prior to that point? There was some awareness is the A until the early 80s, the AFA was the largest astrological group function in existence. And NCGR and ESAR were first being formed. It was in the early 1980s that AFAN was formed. And, but it was the AFA that was putting on major conferences, um, especially until UAC of 1986. They had certification exams going on. And in their certification exams, they were using Placidus house cusps and being able to interpolate those cusps. So I think they were in sync with the majority of the astrological community that was using Placidus at this time. But Holden, who was esteemed as a scholar in research of ancient astrology, was putting out in his publications of the existence of whole sign houses. Right. Well, he was actually the, the AFA's research director, right, director he was. of research. And in the research of journal, his the research journal, he was publishing material um, attesting to their existence a whole decade before Robert Schmidt and Robert Han landed upon it in the early text that they were translating. Right. And he actually sent me um, a copy of his original article and it was from 1982, published mm -hmm. in the very first AFA Journal of Research, which he started. He was like heading yes. up this project that they should have a journal in order to publish kind of like academic articles on astrology, like academic scholars had been for you know several decades yeah. up to that point. Um, and he published an article titled Ancient House Division. And this is the one where for a long time, I thought this was the first source that recognized whole sign houses in modern times. And I've since realized that there's actually three or four earlier sources in German and French and English, um, including David Pingree, including a treatment by um, Walter Koch, the inventor of the Koch system of house division. But for our purposes, the most important point is he, um, Holden has this line where he explains whole sign houses. Um, and this is the passage in this retyped version, but I actually have an image just so it's clear from the um, original text where he puts some emphasis on a certain term. So he says, starting from the rising sign, the houses were numbered off in succession. In the example given above, the first house would have been Leo, the second Virgo, the third Libra, etc. This was the first system of house division. I have not encountered any name for it in the literature, so for convenience, I shall refer to it as the sign house system. Note that the reckoning was by whole signs. This means that if the first house was Leo, then the entire sign of Leo constituted the first house, the entire sign of Virgo, the second house, and so on. This is the primitive form of equal house division. It is found in the papyri from the earliest to the latest, mm -hmm. and it is still in widespread use in India. Correct. Um, and then finally, he concludes that paper in 1982 saying, conclusion, because he, he then goes on to talk about the other systems of house division that were popular in the Hellenistic and um, medieval tradition, early medieval tradition, and he says, the five systems of house division set forth above are the systems of classical antiquity. Interestingly, the two oldest systems, sign house and equal house, have been in constant use since their invention, thus presumably get, giving satisfaction to their users. By contrast, the earliest quadrant systems have fallen out of favor, fallen from favor. It would in fact seem that there is some essential difficulty with quadrant systems, since no less than five, Campanus, Regiomontanus, Placidus, Coke, and Toprocentric, have gained some success since the 13th century. So I just wanted to clarify that because there's been some either downplaying of James Holden saying that he didn't recognize whole sign houses or downplaying the extent to which he did, but this is actually one of his most significant 
and notable things in his career that he actually keeps mentioning over and over again at different points in his publication history. Um, but the problem with it is that it, it's inconvenient for the narrative that Holstein Houses was invented by Project Hindsight, mm -hmm. which is part of the narrative that's being put forward at this time, because Holden wrote that 10 years earlier. Yes, mm -hmm. but that's exactly the case. So, all right. So it's um, the 1990s. You're the first subscriber to Project Hindsight, and um, you are sort of confronted with these different systems. Right. And I'm using, looking at all of them. I'm experimenting with all of them. And then by 1997, um, I decide to return to my education and get a master's degree in classics at the University of Oregon. So I just want to clarify, because yeah. according to Deborah Holding, you immediately transitioned into doing traditional astrology and there was a virtually overnight shift in terms right. of that right and that's the point I'm getting to it took me 10 years from the first encounter with whole sign houses and project hindsight until I actually began to fully adopt the use of them and then in the interim I went back to university I got a master's degree in reading Greek and Latin I had a wonderful department who allowed me to do um, independent studies and in translating astrological texts from the CCAG under their supervision. And in the um, course of that, I continued to do readings because we're, even we're going to school, we, um, we still keep our careers going. And I remember the moment um, at which I finally got it, so to speak. And I had a chart of a person where their, the degree of their IC was in the third house, the third whole sign house, and they were having a Saturn transit over that IC degree. And in my previous like, quadrant house system astrology, Saturn over the IC, Oh, limitations, restrictions, responsibilities with the matters of parents and home and family. But I was thinking the IC is in the third house. Like I can't exactly say parents and home and family. I have it's in the third house. And so as I was grappling with that, the story that came out from the client was that in the previous um, short period of time, her parents had become ill, they passed away, and now there was an estate to settle, especially their home and their property. And there were difficulties going on between her and her siblings, I see in the third house, concerning settling the parents' estate of their home fourth house and then that point that moment I, was that aha realization of how the themes of the I see whatever it represents as our foundation our ground traditionally associated with the fourth house it pulled into relevance with third house factors so was sibling her struggle with her siblings over fourth house matters and that was that was one of the those big moments where, like, I get it after years of staring at the charts. The um, outcome of my getting the master's degree was then I became, just do you to want clarify. to say something? Yeah. Yeah, I just want to clarify that. So because one of the points that's important is that people that use whole sign houses still take the degree of the IC and the degree of the MC into account and use them as floating points that can fall in different mm -hmm. whole sign houses yes. and, and import the topics of those points into that whole sign house so that there's overlapping topics. And that's a technique that we all learned from book five of Vadius Valens, where yes. he does that and he demonstrates exactly. it with a chart, chart example. Exactly. They um, There was certainly the knowledge of how to calculate the midheaven, and it's showing up in a number of historical charts, not a huge amount of them, but enough to say they knew how to roughly calculate it. 
um, I went through Valen's method and saw how he did it, and it wasn't overly difficult um, at all. And so it was always considered a sensitive point in the chart. Um, and both Firmicus and Paulus write about how sometimes the midheaven falls in the ninth house or the 11th house. It's not always in the 10th house. The switch that came over to quadrant was that they took that midheaven point and made it be the beginning of the 10th house. And so that's where some of the um, differences and the discussion, the, the discrepancy lie there. Right. The um, users of whole sign houses in the ancient astrology were looking at the MC and IC degrees as sensitive points within a whole sign chart even within equal houses, those points had that role. Right. So part of the point then is that anybody that used whole sign houses, they're also taking into account to a certain extent um, quadrant houses, and at the very least, the quadrant house angles, if yes. not combining quadrant houses with whole sign houses, or mm -hmm. sometimes combining equal houses with uh, whole sign houses. Yes, yes. Okay, so that's really important because that also means both in terms of the ancient practice, we're recognizing that all of these systems are being used at once and oftentimes together, which they are, for example, in Rhetorius in chapter, I think it's 113, where he has the nativity of a, a grammarian. He has this example where he he keeps jumping back and forth between saying, according to um, the sign placement, the planet is in this house, but according to the quadrant placement, it's in this house, mm -hmm. and he keeps delineating both. And it seems like definitely by that point in the Hellenistic tradition and carrying, carrying on into the medieval tradition, that there was this real attempt to synthesize the whole sign and the quadrant house approaches as much as they could. Yes, I think that that was the case. And it was in fact what I came through in my own process of looking at both house systems is, oh, yes, this is how one might do that. And right. so if I in the 20th century, you know, stumbled across it through um, trial and error and effort, certainly the esteemed astrologers of the early centuries also um, experienced and went through that process of integration. Right. And so the process of, on the one hand, you had reluctance in your personal process of learning whole sign houses, of not being sure about it and not adopting it quickly mm -hmm. and sort of being on the fence for many years. But then eventually you started seeing how you could use whole sign and parts of quadrant houses together. And that was the moment where it sort of clicked and you started becoming um, more open to the idea of using whole sign houses. Exactly. Okay, but this is like years after right, the right, initial... the year, right, years, years into the process. And then after I finished graduate school, I became part of Kepler College. It just opened. I became part of the first year faculty in the teaching of a the history of ancient and medieval astrology, which was a project I had done, what, team teaching with Nicholas Campion and Robert Hand and Lee Lehman. And in the course of that year, near the end of it, um, Project Hindsight was, were themselves getting more grounded in understanding the text and, and how they related to a practice of Hellenistic astrology. And they were offering some intensives in that, that I attended. And then that was the summer of 2001. And I realized that it was very important that that material be taught at Kepler College. We we're going through a, a whole year of the history of the ancient time period. And here we had the actual practice of that kind of astrology. So it was obvious that should be included. And it was... Um, Initially, a challenging process because the people who had designed Kepler College, starting in the early 90s, 
before Project Hindsight had not included a study of Hellenistic astrology in the curriculum because that notion hadn't yet coalesced in the astrological community. That was at least three years before Project Hindsight. Mm -hmm. And so there was no place. And at that point, um, Dennis Harness, who had been contracted to teach a course in Vedic astrology, and Dennis had um, got his degree at uh, CIIS, where Rick now Rick Tarnas now has a program, but it was about cross-cultural integration and transmission. And he said, well, let's teach a Hellenistic Vedic course together, and we will present, you present the Hellenistic view of planets, I'll present the Vedic view of planets. And so each week, we did this cross-cultural comparison of the three uh of the two traditions. And that was the very first course in Hellenistic astrology that was taught in the United States. And um, Robert Schmidt gave me permission to do it. And he and Alan White, especially Alan White, helped me develop the course that was then taught at Kepler College. And right. so by that time, um, as I was teaching whole sign houses, I had already um, adopted the use of whole sign houses in my own practice. Okay. And this is basically then that's 2002. So we're talking mm -hmm. about 10, 10 years after Project Hindsight started? Yes. Okay. So I just want to make the point that it wasn't like, oh, I heard this stuff and I immediately jumped on the bandwagon and began teaching it. And then the publication of the two books on ancient astrology that occurred 20 years after I first encountered Hellenistic astrology. Right. In uh, 2019 and 2022. 20. Yes. Okay. Um, so that's really important because the way it was portrayed was just like all these modern astrologers practically overnight switched from modern to traditional. And while there's something to that in terms of everybody who was an astrologer in the late 20th century essentially started out as a modern astrologer yeah. because that's what astrology was. And then everybody eventually went through a process sometimes of learning traditional astrology and adopting some of those techniques. Um, that was oftentimes a process that people went through slowly over time and that people mm -hmm. learned. And one of the things that's ironic is that 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 was also a process that Deborah Holding herself went through, but it was just a few years earlier, like four years earlier than I guess you did, but it wasn't that different where in the UK, there was people that were getting excited about William Lilly and the recovery of his text and going back and adopting some of his methods, which were different than modern astrology. So it's not just like uh, an American phenomenon, but it was something that was also happening in the UK. Yes, yes. Okay, so moving on moving to on. the first issue. Okay, um, there was a statement that um, Project Hindsight refused to look at astrology in the context of a tradition and that they did not care about other traditions. And I found that I also wanted to correct the record on that statement as simply not being the case. Right. And, and so Robert Schmidt, certainly his skill set was in Greek language and philosophy. And his central focus was in the health on the Hellenistic astrology that was written in Greek. And one of the earmarks of scholars delving into a topic is that they keep their focus narrow and say as much about something small as they can rather than spread too wide and say very little about a lot of different things. So from that point of view, he followed that procedure of keeping his focus on the Hellenistic material that was written in Greek for the work that he himself was creating. But that doesn't mean that he was not 
open, receptive, and facilitating the exposure and inclusion and understanding of other historical traditions and astrology. And so I'll just go through a list of what I knew and saw myself of how he had um, interacted um, with other traditions. Okay, do you want to say anything before I get into my list here? Um, yeah, I just want to, I'm looking through my notes. It was at 13 minutes because I just want to set the context. She claims that Project Hindsight started right from the beginning with answers to everything as if everything was a foregone conclusion, um, which is something we'll get to, yeah. which, which is false, but um, also just the idea and the specific statement that they weren't open to other traditions mm -hmm. and that it was all just about the Greek material and that it was all um, not looking at the Arabic material or, or any other related traditions mm -hmm. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's just uh, start with the Babylon. Yeah, there it is. One of them. One of the statements was okay. um, one of the things she says. Quote: One of the things Project Hindsight did was they refused to look at astrology in the context of a tradition or in the context of the mm -hmm. tradition. And then she goes on. Quote: They didn't care what was in the Arabic texts because that wasn't part of the Hellenistic texts that were being translated. So it's setting up this whole thing where um, they didn't care and they didn't look into any other traditions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm saying that was not the situation that I saw. So um, let's begin with the Babylonian tradition that the well, Babylonians had a history of astrology, of astral observations, divination. Almost well, 2,000 years before the Hellenistic. Well, and, and even before that, just like with the three principal translators, mm -hmm. you know, wasn't like Zoller's very first, one of the very first translations that Project Hindsight published was Zoller's translation of Alkindi's right, on Stellar yeah. Rays. Yeah, I'm going to get to all of that. I just okay, want to okay. start with, I have my Got list it. that I organized and I'm going to get there. <laughs> Got it. But so I want to start with the Babylonian. Okay. Because that's the earliest in our layers of history. That's the earliest. And she says in the lecture, Deborah says that the Babylonian tradition was not considered. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And one of Schmidt's um, closest friends was Maggie McPherson. Um, and Maggie was a brilliant astrologer. She had a PhD from McPherson. Guild University, of all of the people who gravitated around Project Hindsight, um, Schmidt considered her um, most as his intellectual peer and equal, and had ex frequent extended conversations with her. And Maggie was a scholar of Babylonian astrology. She knew how to read Akkadian and was able to read the astrological cuneiform texts. And in their many, many conversations, they exchanged knowledge and information. Maggie presented to him knowledge and information about Babylonian astrology that he always kept in the back of his mind as he was developing the Hellenistic. Um, at Kepler, he had asked Maggie to teach the advanced Hellenistic class, which she did at Kepler for several terms. And so Maggie was able to come to Kepler and taught um, a group of Kepler students about Babylonian astrology. Maria Matus was one of them, um, who then went on to develop her work in Babylonian astrology. So in that, I would say that Schmidt was very open to exchanging and discussing that, and then also facilitating someone who is skilled in that in being able to present that material under the umbrella of Hellenistic astrology at Kepler that had been um, under Schmidt's um, organized or supervised under Schmidt's umbrella. Right. And so she, 
was she did she teach some Hellenistic stuff before you or was that after you at it was af- it was after me okay but so but it was that- a part two it was advanced I taught the beginning and then Maggie taught the advance and then Maggie passed away way too soon for the person that she was and so that didn't happen after that point that she taught the class but by that time I had developed um, intermediate and advanced units at Kepler right she passed away of cancer in like yeah. the mid to like 2004 or five or yes, something like right. that mm-hmm. so it cut that off but the point is that somebody who read Akkadian and was focused on the Babylonian tradition was besides you the other project hindsight representative that yes. was sent to teach Hellenistic astrology at Kepler yes thank you okay. Chris for cl- putting it so concisely mm-hmm. okay so that's the Babylonian I'm going to get to the Arabic, but I want to um, put some discussions about the connection with the Vedic tradition in here, because so much of that happened in 1995, that was in the very early years of Project Hindsight. And after um, Schmidt and Hand, um, began translating, they had come across the notion of whole sign houses, as well as various time lord techniques. And we're in some ways claiming, hey, look at what we discovered um, in the original system. And many of the Vedic astrologers said, wait a second, we've been using whole sign houses continuously for almost 2,000 years, it never disappeared in our tradition, especially in the South Indian tradition. Whole sign houses were used continually and still are. And the Vedic astrologers also said, we have time lord systems, the dashas, and like, let's get clear here on who's claiming what. And so initially, there was a little bit of tension that Um, came up. And in the um, Project Hindsight had their first uh, conclave in the summer of 1994. So really quickly, mm -hmm. sorry, if you don't mind. um, So one of the things is like right away in the very first translation of the Greek, first Greek translation that they did was Paulus Alexandrinus and who lived in the fourth century and wrote an introduction to astrology in Greek. And right away in Hand's introduction to this, he notes that Paulus is using the signs as houses and that he's using whole mm-hmm. sign houses. And Hand also notes that this is also used in the Indian tradition. Yes. Um, let me, I'll see if I can put it okay, up on, okay. on the screen. Um it actually might take, but but the point is, I'll I'll try to find the file in a minute and put it up on the screen. Mm-hmm. But the point is that very early on, they start finding stuff, and one of the things about Hand, because Hand is characterized entirely as a modern astrologer that just like went traditional overnight in Holdings Lecture, but Hand actually studied the history of astrology, and he went back and he studied different texts from people like Ptolemy. Um, he was had some awareness of Indian astrology and other things mm-hmm. before Project Hindsight, it seems like. So yes. they sort of start recognizing early on that there's like parallels or similarities between Hellenistic and Indian astrology. Yes. And so, and because of the tension that that created, initial tension between the American Vedic astrologers and Project Hindsight, um, at the second conclave that Project Hindsight had in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, they invited a number of Vedic astrologers as their guests, not only to attend, but also to present on Vedic astrology. And so in the morning, we had Hellenistic presentations. In the afternoons, we had Vedic presentations. And there was the openness to beginning to acknowledge and respond and see the contrasts and the similarities between the two traditions in a spirit of 
openness and receptivity. And I um, remember uh, Ronnie Dreyer, who's a Vedic astrologer attending that I had a new friendship developing with and uh, Ken Irving, who would become her husband a number of years down the line, also attending. And I queried them, like, what do you remember from that time? And one of the memories was that when Schmidt was talking about whole sign houses, K.N. Rao, who was a famous Indian astrologer, who was the guest of honor in the Vedic community there, began to read from a Vedic text about whole sign houses. And there was this sense that Schmidt had of delight that things that he was seeing in the Hellenistic were also verified in the ancient texts of the Vedic astrology. And so there was this incredible sense of um, beginnings of cooperation and exchange that were happening. Right. Okay. So quite, instead of being like not open to cross-referencing with other traditions, which is what was stated explicitly, in fact, Project Hindsight was actively looking at and comparing the different traditions and noticing parallels and that was actually helping them to understand the greek material better yes and i, I was there at that conference so this is i'm reporting what i saw there right and then uh two months later in september of 1995 dennis harness and dennis flaherty um who were among the leaders of the American Vedic community, um, held what they um, sort of referred to, jokingly referred to as the Sedona Summit, where members of Project Hindsight were invited to Sedona. Dennis had rented um, a really big lodge kind of house. A number of Vedic astrologers went and some interested, a few interested members of the community also attended, where they spent three to five days in a more focused and deep discussion of the comparisons between Hellenistic and Vedic and sorting out a lot of the um, details that would have been too technical in the large conclave. And I was not there because I was leading a trip to Greece during that time period, but I was aware of it. And Zoller also attended, even though he was no longer formally part of Project Hindsight. And we'll, we may touch on that in a little bit, but he also, he also attended that. Um, so we have part two of the connection with the Vedic community. And then part three occurs the next month in October of 1995, when Dennis Flaherty and Dennis Harness sponsored the Sacred Astrology Conference in Seattle. And all of the hindsight people were invited to give presentations, and they all came. Now, um, a piece of um, uh, oral history connected with that conference that I thought uh, your listeners might enjoy hearing was that uh, Susie Cox, who did a lot of experiential astrology at that point, was asked to create the Saturday Night Entertainment. And for that, um, she, along with Ronnie Dreyer and Barbara Shermer and myself, um, created a ritual in order to um, finally integrate any remaining friction between the Hellenistic and Vedic community. Um, Chakra Pani gave the invocation and the um, chant that we used was that many people in the audience sang as did the other people in the ritual. It was weave and mend, gather the scattered fragments, weave and mend the sacred circle, weave and mend. And there were four representatives from the Veda community, four representatives from the Hellenistic, Schmidt and Hand and Zoller and Ellen Black, um, and four representatives from the 
feminist community that were saying, hey, wait a second, what about femi feminist astrology? Our voices need to be heard and recognized as well. And Barbara Shermer unraveled this ball of yarn. And so like we're the three fates here. And she um, wrapped this yarn around everyone, sort of tying them together as the audience was singing Weave and Mend. And then when she was done, she asked the 12 people in the circle to just like lower the yarn and step outside of it. And it created a perfect zodiacal circle with the 12 houses. And that was like the sort of culmination of that. But it was a, a beautiful experience that was a community participation in the bringing together of what were at that time somewhat fractitious factions within the community and facilitating um, an integration. Wow. Okay. And after that, you know, a lot of the tension, um, at least between the Project Hindsight and the Veda community seemed to subside. Because part of, part of it was while there was a revival of interest suddenly in traditional astrology in the West in the late 80s and early 90s, there was kind of like a parallel um, surge in interest in mm -hmm. Indian astrology in the West yes. in the 80s and 90s. And so that's why you have these two parallel groups that are comparing traditions, but also sometimes having um, tensions in terms of like mm -hmm. debates about like whose tradition is older, yeah. what what have you. But then also that are are coming together in different ways at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So should we move on to the Arabic now? Yes. So I learned, I was told in that lecture that there was no reference to any Arabic authors or interest in the Arabic tradition in Project Hindsight. Right. That's what I heard as well. And that we see Project Hindsight was never only about the Greek reclaiming that tradition. It was also about a Latin track where Arabic authors who had been translated um, into Latin during the 12th century translations were now being translated into English. Um, and the auth and they Project Hindsight put out um, translations of Mashahala, of Omer, of Tiberius, of Abu Mashar, and Al Kindi. And you're going to show some of those? Yeah, it's like, yeah. Um, so Al Kindi was the very first translation that they published with the Latin track that Zoller published in um, 1993. And Al Kindi mm -hmm. was a ninth century Arabic philosopher and astrologer. And that's literally what they started with was a translation of this text. So it's like, yeah. It can't get more the opposite. And then later they also translated, um, as you said, Omar of or Umar al, mm -hmm. al Tabari. Yeah. Um, Masha Allah was another text mm -hmm. that hand translated with hindsight and then on his own. And then also even Schmidt himself. Um even right. Schmidt himself translated. Book two of Abu Mashar's text on solar revolutions, which was written in Arabic in the ninth century, like they were actively actually interested in and looking at the other traditions and seeing the continuity from the Babylonian tradition to the Hellenistic mm -hmm. tradition to the medieval Arabic and Latin traditions. Yes. Um, and I don't know if you maybe you already clarified this later, yeah. but it brings up an important point, which is that. Um, Zoller translated like five or six different texts with Project Hindsight. And according to Deborah Holding, he was only with Project Hindsight for three months. So I'm curious how that's possible to publish all of that in such a short time, or is that not true? Um, he was there for uh, several years. And certainly he was connected with them, as far as I witnessed, as early as 1992, but perhaps... Zoller had a connection with Robert Hahn at least a decade earlier. So when Robert Hahn became interested in the pro what would become Project Hindsight, I'm sure Zoller was aware and involved in those conversations. 
Right. So right. And Zoller had been translating Latin since 1980, where he learned Latin at the City University of New York under um, Richard LeMay, who was his teacher, who was um, major um, scholar of like scholar Abu of, of Abu Mishar. Right. So at, at, thir at 13 minutes, it's said in the lecture by holding that Zoller, Zoller left within a matter of months, but in reality, Zoller was with Project Hindsight from 1992 until 1995, and he published um, Al-Kindi, the Liber Hermetis Part 1, Liber Hermetis Part 2, Banati Part 1, yes. 2, 3, and 4, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different texts that were all published between 1993 and 1994. Mm -hmm. So that's not true uh, to say that Zoller was there for such a short time. And then there was also some things about saying that Zoller skipped out purely, that he left purely due to um, not liking the what was happening at Project Hindsight in terms of Schmidt or something like that. Um, and I don't know if you want to get into this, but I know there were also just some tensions over um, like translation styles and things like that that were much more mundane in terms of um, some of those reasons. Right. I had a friendship with Zoller um, over the last 20 years of his life. Well, maybe 15 years of his life. And at that time, he was a very... Oh, opinionated and um, fiery kind of individual that very much was independently driven. He had many interests and and his Parkinson's um, disease was developing and accelerating. So there was on one hand some tension with translation issues, styles, conventions that he felt he at that point already had 15 years in as a Latin translator that you couldn't really ever tell Zoller he was like wrong about something. It was just the nature of his um, personality. But he also had many other interests that he wanted to pursue. And his physical health was becoming more fragile. And so I think it was a combination of those three factors that all converge to lead him to uh, separate from the project and be able to pursue what he wanted to do in his own way, because that was his nature. Okay. Um, and some of his students, because he's painted as like a, he's painted as being outside of hindsight, which is wrong since he was with mm -hmm. them for a while and he was one of the founders. Um, but also I think he's not recognized in that lecture as actually somebody who did incorporate whole sign houses, because um, some of his students have told me that he taught that you're supposed to use a mixture of whole sign and mm -hmm. alchemicious in his courses. Yeah. And I was actually able to find um, like some passages from his handbook that was were given to students uh, in 2002 that was published in 2002 that that says this um, so he's defining house systems and he says a house system is a division of space around the earth into 12 divisions each of which corresponds to one or more area of life um, in the medieval astrology of the latin west the system of houses most frequently used was that of alcabicius this seems to have been largely because his writing on the mathematics of astrology was so lucid whole sign houses are another widely used house system that was used as such by Ptolemy and Bonatti. We will be using both the Alcabicius and the whole sign house systems together at the same time. Um, and then he goes on, but he that's basically how he was teaching his students. And when he describes the history of house division, um, he des describes it as one of the early systems, uh, whole mm -hmm. sign houses. He says, this early methodology thus equates houses with the signs. The first sign, i.e. the one in which the horoscope falls, is the first house. That makes the following sign the second house. The third sign is the third house, and so on and so forth. Um, so I just wanted to point that out just because, 
you know, Zoller, and this is due to partially his familiarity with the early and later medieval tradition, where many of those authors like Masha Allah and Saul Ibn Bishr were following some of the later Hellenistic astrologers where they were trying to use whole sign and quadrant houses at the same time. So Zoller himself also mm -hmm. was, yeah. was using that method. Right. And then I, between about 2006 and 2007, Zola returned to Project Hindsight and lived there for a year. I think you were there during summer all of that time. Yeah, um, his I, I, health was very difficult and um, Ellen Block took meticulous care of him. And in the course of um, that year, he had many, many discussions with Schmidt. And then a phone conversation we had during that time, he said that he had come to thoroughly accept the validity of whole sign houses as a house system to be used in astrology. And so that showed the uh, development or maturation of his own thinking about the matter over the course of time. Yeah, and when in my conversations in the year that I lived in the same house with him at Project Hindsight, mm -hmm. he was using both whole sign and quadrant houses, and he was trying to find a synthesis of the two. And and actually was one of the earliest people that I saw, you know, successfully creating a practical synthesis of the two, mm -hmm. especially with things like annual perfections and other techniques like that. And I I just know that's one of the things that was a recurring thing that bothered me in watching that lecture, that there's a lot of people in that lecture that are either now dead or incapacitated and therefore can't speak for themselves and that their legacies are kind of being hijacked for something that I, I know they wouldn't have approved of. Mm -hmm. um, and Zoller here with this, I think, is, is definitely one. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Chris, for bringing that fully to the fore. All right, so... The last thing I think you were going to mention in this area was, I mean, there, there was also the medieval Hebrew tradition. Right. And the Western medieval of um, a number of translations that were done as well. So Project Hindsight publications encompassed the Arabic, the medieval Western in Western Europe, as well as the Renaissance, and right. the works that they published in translation. So some of the Renaissance authors are like yeah. Schoner or Raymond Lull, mm -hmm. um, and the early medieval authors are Benati. But then they also had Mira Epstein come in, and she translated a book or two of Abraham Ibn Ezra from Hebrew into English. Yes. So then just sort of capping off that hindsight was not open to other historical traditions in the 2006 conclave that was held, um, the faculty um, included um, Kenneth Bowser giving talks on Babylonian astrology and Western sidereal tradition of Benjamin Dykes on Arabic and medieval astrology, on Kenneth Johnson on the Indian Vedic tradition, and Robert Corey um, gave a lecture on Marinus in the Renaissance before he was uh, called away after one day for an emergency back home. And then Bill Johnson gave a presentation on the humanistic tradition um, developed by Rudyard. And so there was the entire expanse of the other historical traditions being um, highlighted and included within uh, the conclave in 2006. Yeah, and that was the conclave was Project Hindsight hosted essentially a conference yeah. and, and everybody flew out to Project Hindsight for a week and I think that's actually what one of the videos is from that actually Deb took a bunch of pictures and from my video and put them in her mm -hmm. lecture. But a lot of the pictures of people, including you and myself at Project Hindsight, come from the video that's from yeah. that 2006 okay. conclave. Okay. Um, 
And that just reminded me, I was actually, when I was there living there, I forgot that I tried learning ancient Greek first using the biblical Greek workbook that you were teaching your yeah. students with, but I actually forgot that I tried to learn Arabic at the same time. And I learned, <laughs> okay. I learned the Arabic alphabet and I was studying it because I was trying to study the history of horary and how it had developed between the Hellenistic and medieval tradition. Mm -hmm. But that was something that Schmidt supported and he um, supported me in that endeavor to learn Arabic or at least attempt to learn Arabic, I turned out to not be the greatest language scholar compared to him or, or you, but to learn Arabic. And then wasn't it was at that conclave that actually he gave me one of my very first speaking positions where I got up and I presented my paper on the history and origins mm -hmm. of horary that covered the Hellenistic and medieval yeah. traditions. Um, so that was also part of the like cross, you know, uh, mm -hmm. traditional com component. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I think in there we sort of covered that point. Yeah, I okay. think so. Um, and the last one is just Ben Ben Dykes because Ben comes into the yeah. story at this point, and he's such a like towering figure at this point. But you know, he wasn't. He was just finishing his translation of Bonatti at this point, and yeah, he was given a, a speaking position. At, yes, so actually several, if I remember. Right. Like, yeah. like Schmidt sort of, you know, opened yeah. him with open arms in terms of Ben being an up and coming Latin translator mm -hmm. who at first translated Bonatti, but then he also immediately started translating works of Masha Allah and Saul from the early Arabic tradition. Um, yeah. And so that was kind of important as like Ben kind of, while he was doing his stuff independently, um, Project Hindsight also made room for Ben and was very open to other translators who were coming in and doing their own thing, even if they weren't publishing mm -hmm. with, with Project Hindsight. Right. And now that you mentioned it, Kenneth Johnson had gone back to school and learned Sanskrit and was translating some Sanskrit texts. And it was within that sort of context that he also was invited to give the results of some of his, the findings of his translations of the Indian astrology. Right. And okay. so again, there was like pulling from all of the different um, cultural and historical traditions in the larger scope of what the project was about, with Schmidt himself keeping focused on what his skill set was with the Greek Hellenistic, but also having wide open arms toward other traditions. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Um, so moving on to the second issue, um, which is, I, I, or maybe I'll let you phrase it. Okay. There, there was a, a few lines in the recording that, from the very beginning, what they were doing, what Project Hindsight was doing, was selling a new package of simplified astrology that they were marketing a product. And a few things we um, it would be helpful to remember, there may be some listeners who aren't aware, that many of the Greek astrological texts, while written in the early centuries, um, then became buried in university libraries and in private collections with the loss of the Greek language, the um, fall of the Roman Empire, astrology becoming um, illegal and against the church. And much of this material disappeared um, into archives. And a number of the manuscripts, original manuscripts in Greek, texts were copied over by scribes during the medieval time period because that was one of the meditation activities of, of scribes. And because of that, we have them. But then they weren't put out there in the world or circulated. They were just kept in the archives. And it wasn't until um, the very beginning of the 1900s that the um, uh, Belgian scholar Franz Cumont decided a great project for 
the um, academics to do would be to find all of these manuscripts of Greek astrological texts and make critical editions of them, which is the creme de la creme of a classical astrologer is to find, you know, five or six or 10 manuscripts of the same text and then taking the one that looks like it in its best condition and setting it into type and then mentioning all of the variations and all of the other traditions in the series of footnotes. And a number of other ac European academics joined him in this project, and it took them 50 years to create the CCAG, the Catalog of Greek Astrological Codices, which took the most important astrological Greek texts of the Hellenistic era into a print form where it was accessible to be translated. But these scholars knew Greek and the footnotes were in Latin. They knew Latin. They had no interest in translating it because they were not interested in the astrology per se for the most part. They were interested in the process of developing these critical editions. And so it, while there were some ancient astrological texts in circulation in the community, the bulk of the Hellenistic were later in their formulation. And then it was only several decades later that James Holden started and then Project Hindsight started bringing them into English translation. And so it couldn't have been done before this time because the, what the, arrangement of the text themselves simply was not there in an easily accessible manner. And this was, the fact that they would be translated at that vision was so wildly exciting to the astrological community that we knew we had a long and rich history, but for the most part, with a few exceptions, most of us had no idea of what it actually entailed. And so, when hindsight announced that they were going to bring our whole foundation into English translation, that we would be seeing for the first time in 2000 years, how it was that our astrology began, there was such a sense of excitement and enthusiasm. And it was in some ways, this was the energy around the beginnings. So, Another story I want to tell is that Hindsight was, um, Project Hindsight was announced in April of 1993 at Norwalk. And then sometime that summer, uh, I remember because it was hot outside, there was an ARC conference organized by Ray Merriman at a college campus in Michigan. And we all slept in the dorm rooms and most of us <clears throat> were up in the dorms and we had the doors to our rooms open because everyone was walking up and down the hallway and in and out of each other's rooms and we were visiting and connecting and doing what astrologers do when we see each other. And I bumped into Rob Hands in the hallway and he was so excited about what they were discovering in the translations. And so he pulled me into the room in which Schmidt was. And Schmidt was sitting on a lower bunk bed and he had like a chair in front of him on which he had his computer. And he was busily like translating Paulus and typing in his translation. And we came in and like, he got up with his you know hands out raised. You don't believe what I just discovered in Paulus and began to um, uh, recount it out loud. And it was a feeling of utter and pure joy that was the, the energy in that room. And years later, I um, recognized myself the rarefied kinds of pleasure when you're translating something that perhaps someone hasn't looked at in hundreds and hundreds of years and you're seeing it for the first time, the incredible emotion that takes, that took me over. And I could look back and see that in Schmidt and Rob Hand 
at that moment. And that was what they were riding on rather than coming up with a product that they could package and sell and make money. Now, it's not to say that they didn't need money. They, you know, took subscriptions, they got donations, they got grants in order to support the work that had to be done. Ellen Black gave over her whole inheritance and her family home and heritage to be able to support the project in the course of the years. And that as all of us who are full-time astrologers know, like we've got to do something to make money to survive if we're doing astrology full-time. And so I was um, offended at hearing the characterization that at the beginning, it was all about packaging a product, especially we'll get into this, that they had decided upon before they even began translating as a money-making opportunity to simply sell. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me actually quote it just so we're clear what we're responding to here. But at one point in the lecture, Deborah Holding says, quote, even before the first text was released, they were giving us answers on this is what everybody was doing, and they weren't asking questions. They were selling a new package of astrology. It was simplified, all the aspects. There's no such thing as orbs. There's no such you know, aspects from one sign to the other. There's no such thing as house cusps. They're just you know, 12 signs. You do need to know the, how to count to 12, and you can pretty much you know, get on board with the system, she says flippantly. And then she says the teachings, and there were teachings, um, and I don't know if my transcript is good here, but it says it was set up as a translation project, but it was the community groups. It was mainly the feeling that there was a sense of everybody sits around Robert Schmidt's feet, and he, guru-like, gives his philosophical slant on things. They were not up for discussion, and this wasn't a project set up to answer questions or even explore questions. It was set up to give absolute meaning to what was happening at a stage where I would say we don't know what questions we should be asking at that time. So they're selling a package, but your experience, her portrayal of it is they're selling a package and it's a predefined thing that they came up with before the first translation was published. But one of the things anybody familiar with Project Hindsight knows the moment you pick up one of those translations is that all of those translations were supposed to be preliminary for yeah, one, yeah. that they would do initial translations. Right. And then later at some point, they were going to come back and do a final translation series once they had everything figured out. But what's what's amazing about the translations, if you sit down and read them, is that both Schmidt, the translator, and Hand, the editor, write an introduction and commentary to each one. And then they have footnotes throughout the translation and you can see in these texts, you can see in these texts the evolution of their thinking mm -hmm. and how there's certain things that are like preliminary observations or speculations that they then change later in one of the other translations later in the series, where they have some even like words or translation conventions yes. bracketed as provisional. And sometimes they'll change them or sometimes they'll leave just the Greek word in the text because they aren't sure yet like what to translate that term as into in English. Mm -hmm. And then later they'll they'll try different conventions. There was this whole um, clear process and evolution and development in their thinking that you can see throughout the translation series in print. And, and I feel like it's only in the absence of the fact that so many of those translations are out of print and that most people haven't read them at this point, that that sort of statement can be made at all because that's just the, sort of the opposite of what, what was happening. Okay. Um, that's exactly true. You know, in my own experience with translating, at the beginning, it you're not always sure how to translate a certain term, a word, a concept. And I remember encountering that and asking my professors, like, what, is, what does this mean here? And they weren't sure and contacting Schmidt. And he would say, let me think about it and go up to his room and maybe days or weeks come back, <laughs> give me an answer. And But as you go on in the text and your own understanding of the larger context develops, 
you come across that term again and you go, oh, this is what they're talking about. Like now I get it. And you go back to the beginning and all of a sudden, like there it is, it's staring you at your face, but you didn't have the maturation of your own thinking or understanding to recognize it as such. And so it's a constantly evolving process. And it was one that Schmidt was totally engaged with himself, as he said, the initial ones he said were always provisional, that he would go back. And when I heard that it was like fixed from the beginning, that they had decided ahead of time what everything was going to be, like any of us I started laughing. And for all of us who lived through those early Schmidt years, it was like how many times he changed his mind, like began to make us crazy. Right. And, um, and so there's an understanding that the development of Hellenistic astrology was for him a work in progress and continues to be for those astrologers ahead of us. And that it's important that we as a community understand that process. Now, the second point is that this work that he did was not done in total isolation without continual dis discussion with other people. Are you moving on from the product? Yeah. Part? Yeah. I think I'm moving on from um, the idea. I'm going like more into it was not fixed from the beginning. The idea of it was fixed from the beginning as a product. Okay, it was not a product and it was not fixed from the beginning. Let me clarify one last okay. thing on the product point then before we move on, because it's something I've been thinking a lot about yeah. the past few days after seeing that argument. One of the things I was I was thinking about and looking back and reflecting on was in 1992 or 1993, Deborah Holding founded the Traditional Astrologer magazine, which was sold through subscriptions. And she also founded Acela Publications, where she went back and she wasn't a translator herself, but she would find translations that other academics had done or other astrologers had done of historical texts, and she would reprint them through her publication company, mm -hmm. Acela. So for example, I think it was in 1993 or 1996, she published a translate David Pingree's translation of, of Dorotheus. She got the rights supposedly to publish the English translation of Dorotheus, and she published it through her company. So that was an early Hellenistic text. I think they also republished Bram's translation of Firmicus Maternus and a number of other texts. So in a way, part of the issue here is that um, Project Hindsight was like kind of a competitor to her and doing the same thing, but also to whatever extent um, Project Hindsight was making money from selling translations or what have you. She was doing the same thing. So there's a, a certain level of hypocrisy there if Project Hindsight is being framed as as like a money-making venture because they're being supported by sales of their translations and stuff when the same thing's happening there in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to point that out before we move on from the okay. like Project Hindsight was just a product thing. Okay, okay. Because it's part of the historical context it is, it, of yes, yeah. Right. All right. And I wanted to add the inspiration, the enthusiasm, the sense of excitement of uncovering the foundations of our history. Right. That's what I saw as being foremost in what was going on. Well, and, and we it, all have we all have to live and we all have to eat at the same time. Yeah. Well, and it's like everyone was feeling that because it's yes. like to be to be fair, you know, Deborah Holding was also excited yes. about traditional astrology mm -hmm. and um all the people in the UK that were super into Horary and Lily and that were taking Olivia Barclay's course were excited about going back to the tradition. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get figures like, you know, John Frawley um, and other people that also went on to have major careers as traditional astrologers. So there was just this general excitement in the air in the late 80s and early 90s. And everybody was kind of doing a similar thing for some reason in different different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. All right, so moving on to the next part, um, you had this quote from her or a 
sort of uh, summary mm -hmm. of it. Is it a summary or is it an exact quote? Because I can pull the exact quote out if needed. Um, I don't remember. Okay, let me um, find it because I don't want to misstate anything. Um, um, it's kind of a synopsis of a few different okay. things. Okay, okay. But, but basically it's this few paragraphs mm -hmm. um, where I just, I read the first part of it where mm -hmm. it was like, um, Project Hindsight is that this project started right from the beginning with absolute answers to everything, even before the first text were released, et cetera. Yeah, I guess I've already okay. writ written all that. But okay, you, right, not asking or exploring questions. Right. Teaching's not open to discussion. So in your summary was Project Hindsight had decided everything from the beginning. There's an intent to provide absolute answers even before the first text was released and not asking or exploring questions and that the teachings themselves were not open to discussion, which is an accurate summary of the like three paragraphs I read earlier. Mm -hmm. And we did speak, first of all, about changing one's mind right. as one matures one's understanding of astrology. The second point to that is that not asking or exploring questions, the teachings not open to discussion. And that's what I want to um, bring out next. Okay. And that well, it is true that Schmidt spent a huge amount of time by himself in his upstairs room um, translating. He was also in the continual process of sharing and discussing it and working out the concepts with both other astrologers who lived in the house, who lived nearby, the many who came to visit and stay with them for various periods of time. There was a huge community over the years of the welcoming of astrologers into their home, um, of being very gracious hosts, encouraging them to stay as long as they wanted, and that the allusion to the back porch discussions was being legendary. So I spent a lot of time on the back porch with many astrologers talking into the wee hours of the night as all these different ideas that were coming up in the translations were talked about and people offering their own understanding of it and listening to what Schmidt had to say and challenging him on certain points and asking difficult questions as collectively there was the emergence of an understanding. And that Schmidt, I remember, you know, Schmidt being um, challenged by Alan White, who, you know, in his very loud and brash, you know, voice would say, oh, Schmidt, why are you full of it here? Um, and then pushing Schmidt to um, rethink it, to become more articulate, to go back and not contradict himself. And so um, I saw that the development of their understanding was a process shared among a community of astrologers that was a continual inquiry of reflection, of debate and revision. And some of the people I remember seeing in the house and on the back porch, and I'll just, I just put together the small list here, was of course, Robert Han, Robert Zoller, Alan White, Bill Johnson, Ellen Black, Slavin Slobenyak from um, Croatia, um, Robert Gross, the, he was the um, librarian from the Library of Congress who lived on the same street and was a supporter of the project, of Dale Nelson, Joseph Crane, Marilyn Lawrence, Curtis Manwaring, Michael Earlywine, Maggie McPherson, Kyle Pierce, Kenneth Johnson, Ben Dykes, Kenneth Bowser, Jeanette Jarowski, Nick Dagan Best, uh, Chris Brennan yourself, Stacy and Meredith, whose last names I can't remember. 
Um, and that's just among the ones I can easily recall that are not part of people who also came for conclaves, but were part of the intense discussions. And I know that there are many others who were there when I wasn't. So um, those names I haven't included, but these are the people I saw. And so there was that. And then there was also at the beginning of the project, the as the internet first came on was the group email lists where everyone would subscribe and then someone would comment and that comment would go to everyone else on the list. And sometimes you get 50 emails a day of this ongoing discussion that was happening among those people um, interested and signed up for the list. So I, a few other things I want to say, but I want to give it back over to you to also share your impressions of having lived there and witness the all of the people coming in and out and staying and being engaged in discussion. Yeah, I mean, um, there were just so many different people that were involved. And um, I know that Schmidt incorporated different things and there were many discussions and he was open to discussion. And while he could develop very firm opinions about different things, um, he didn't typically try to like squelch discussions about things, but instead there was a lot of different viewpoints that were always being entertained and a lot of different people that were around contributing different ideas. And that was one of the interesting things about Schmidt is that he would always listen and he would always listen openly to people. Um, yeah, and I, I don't know, it was a really important point, but mm -hmm. that's that's really important thing that you said at the end, though, is that they also hosted um, like a discussion forum in the early days of the internet mm -hmm. in the mid-1990s, in like 1995, 1996. So contrary to the assertion that they weren't open to having discussions or anything like that, they were the ones that actually had like a email discussion list where there were active debates and discussions about different topics taking place. Mm -hmm. And I I have um, memories in the summer of 1996 of that email group list that was going on. Um, that summer, I was staying at Zoller's house in New Paltz because that's where I got my undergraduate degree and I needed these two more classes to complete the prerequisites for me to start my program at the University of Oregon the next year. So I just went there to do that. And in the course of that time, I had my computer and was part of this list and you know, the machine would ding every time a new email came in. So that was happening like you know, for hours every day and evening. And we saw the list, be, the discussions become increasingly contentious and adversarial and flaming. And I remember being shocked at what was being hurled back and forth. Um, and I have that memory that I'd say, you know, to Zoller, oh my goodness, like, you don't believe what someone, what was just said, like, you know, come look at this. And it was very intense. And some of the um, disagreements that are happening now were happening then and their roots go back to the early nineties. So, Part of what we're seeing in this debate currently happening has been going on for 30 years now in different iterations, at least since then. Yeah, and uh, to be more specific, and I hope it's okay to be that Schmidt and Holding had some legendary blowout debates basically over those that email list set up by Project Hindsight and that's where a lot of this goes back to is some of those early debates between the two of them are still being reiterated and played out again today, mm -hmm. like 30 years later. Um, yes. And then as a result of that, the list came, they closed down the list because it simply wasn't seemly 
for um, that kind of languaging to be public. And as the email lists often did at that time, the whole notion of flaming um, wasn't a good thing for the community. Right. Um, yeah. I. So that's important context just in terms of the personal animosity between um, Holding and Schmidt because I think a lot of the history of Project Hindsight that was told in the lecture was twisted and distorted and sometimes um, just completely fabricated in an, in an un, inaccurate way, partially because there's this long-standing dispute between one of the founders of Project Hindsight and the person that gave that lecture this week. Um, so that's kind of a tricky thing in terms of the history, all of this, because I wasn't around for that, but I still heard um, legends of it from lots of different people and then realized that I had walked into it at some point later when I do come into the community in the mm -hmm. mid 2000s and that sometimes younger astrologers, when they come into the community, they accidentally get caught up in some of these old disputes that have been going on between people for years. And sometimes when you don't know that context, um, it's easy to end up like in one camp or the other, or in, end up thinking one thing or another based on um, what you know um, people that are on one side or another are telling you. Yeah. So um, that though is just evidence though that they were open to discussion and there were discussions happening. It's just that not everybody liked the conclusions that Project Hindsight was finding, mm -hmm. and that was sometimes creating tensions in the community because, for instance, sometimes people didn't like that Project Hindsight was saying that whole sign houses existed in ancient astrology. <laughs> uh, I, I remember in the early years of teaching Hellenistic astrology and how horrified people were at the notion of redoing their charts in whole sign houses. And that created all kinds. Well, it created two things. On one hand, it's like, I don't want to hear that you're questioning the validity of the health system I've been using and built my career and reputation on. Like, that's I don't want what, to hear I don't want to hear that. That's what people would say to you. That's what they would say to you when you, you tried to teach them whole sign houses. Well, that was certainly one, one kind of objection. The other was, was that it created identity crises, because if you thought you had, you know, all these planets in the 11th house and you were like, yay, friends and groups, and then all, all of a sudden they fell into the 12th house and you're dealing with your suffering and sorrows, um, that was difficult for people to take in and consider if they didn't like the way their chart shifted um, in a whole sign house system. And so there was resistance coming from that point of view as well. Like if you know, I'm a 12th house person, not an 11th house person, like who am I? And so that there were levels of um, how it was that these teachings stirred up strong and difficult uh, reactions in the community. And then yet for others, it was the realization, oh, like now my life like totally comes in, like this new chart completely puts my life into a focus that I know is the focus, but the chart, like the old chart never reflected. So there was also, there was that kind of response as well. But in those first years, you'd go into a lecture and you'd say, you know, how many people know about whole sign houses? And maybe one or two or three people might raise their hands. And by the end of the 2000s, you would go in and half to two thirds of the room would raise their hands. And so we did see the progressive um, awareness um, develop in the astrological community over the course of that decade. Right, I remember, um... I remember I learned it. I first came across the idea in the mid 2000s from Rob Hand, maybe around 
2004 or something from reading an article online, the concept of whole sign houses. Mm -hmm. And I was like, not interested at all. And I thought that was a really dumb idea, yeah. frankly, because I was used to my Placidus chart and my background was entirely in modern astrology. Um, and it was only when I learned Hellenistic astrology a year or so later and learned the full system and how the whole sign house system integrated with some of the other techniques. And you could see the complexity of it that I was more open to like trying it out mm -hmm. sort of more honestly and then eventually um, liking it and ending up adopting that as my primary system. Um, but I was still surprised how few people, how much resistance there still was to whole sign houses at that mm -hmm. point in the mid to late 2000s. Yeah. It really was like 1% maybe or less of, of astrologers that used that as their primary system. And so oftentimes when talking to other astrologers about your approach, you would end up having to like defend using such a weird system mm -hmm. that was so radically different compared to the standard quadrant house systems. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, in, in a lot of my early blog posts and other things like that, though, it was still like, an ex it was exciting that there was a new technique that was discovered that hadn't been very popular in astrology up to that point. Um, but techniques like that or like sect, like the distinction between day and night charts that hadn't been a technique in popular use up to that time, or time lord techniques or other things like that. So what, there was this enthusiasm sometimes when people adopted some of that stuff to promote it um, in different ways. Um, yeah, and I know I was very enthusiastic about it at a certain point, especially when I was younger, in my 20s, um, and would sometimes do it like jokingly or promote it much more actively instead of just passively. Um, yeah, but I think I, after hitting some of the, walking into some of the debates with this, for example, putting out my lecture on whole sign houses in 2015, and then getting some really strong accusations from like Deborah Holding at that point uh, about it. Like I was a little bit more careful in my messaging from that point forward in um, how I talked about house division and specifically about the history of house division from that point forward. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but this is like a recurring thing that keeps coming up in the community, but I don't know that there's anybody, I mean, did you ever get into or observe debates that got that strong before this? About other astrological techniques or con or concepts? Yeah. It's hard to say because before that, I was perhaps still in the category of younger astrologer where a lot of times you're not fully aware of the currents that are going on in the more established community members. So right. I would have to, I would have to think about that before I could respond. Yeah. Um, I guess one of the points is well, just... I, well, I could say about the asteroids because what I have a history of, trying to introduce unpopular concepts <laughs> into the yeah, astrological that... material. And the asteroids no. were definitely not popular at the time that um, I took up um, trying to um, educate the community about their um, influence and their power and their meaning. It's like, right. oh, we don't need like all those things. We're doing fine with the 10 planets we have already have. They're just pieces of floating gravel out there. And then there were, um, I also became aware of comments in the 1930s of astrologers saying, what do we need Pluto for? We're doing fine with the nine planets we already have. <laughs> what do we need right. something else cluttering up our chart? So it's not uncommon for there to be a natural kind of resistance to a new concept that challenges the status quo of what is considered to be um, established. Right. Um, I guess one of my points is that while there was some enthusiasm in promoting whole sign houses early on, um, I don't think people were aggressively 
attacking like quadrant house users in order to promote whole sign houses. Exactly. No, you're you're right. No, you're right there. It was hey, this is like look at this rather than what you are doing is wrong. Right. And it's like even even in my lecture in 2015 um what happened with that is I was, I was talking with Adam Ellenboss recently and he re he reminded me actually what happened because I was curious about the um title um and he told me that Adam Ellenboss asked me to do a talk on Holstein houses and their history and he said what's funny is that I asked you to give a talk on Holstein houses and then I asked you to come up with a catchier title because I gave it something boring at the time, which was just like <laughs> the history of Holstein houses. <laughs> so he says, so you said, how about Holstein houses, literally the best system of house division <laughs> ever. And he says, quote, and it was totally supposed to be a joke as a way of just spicing up the title of the talk for the purposes of marketing. And what's really funny about that is that you know, holding especially reacted so viscerally to that and began at attacking me afterwards and then um, shares slides from the beginning of that talk in this one. But at the end of that talk, um, I ended it on a completely conciliatory tone of, you know, it doesn't matter what system of house division you use, but I'm just demonstrating some of the reasons why I choose this one and some of the historical considerations behind it. But mm -hmm. that ultimately, the Hellenistic astrologers themselves, I said, um, seem like they wanted to find a synthesis between whole sign houses and quadrant houses, and that that, I think, is what we should move towards and try to figure out today. And that's something I keep repeating over and over again mm -hmm. over the past few years, anytime this comes up. But part of the issue is that the house division debates keep coming up, not because whole sign house proponents are trying to dogmatically force um, this system of house division on other people, but because um, there's this one quadrant house proponent that just hates whole sign houses and has been repeatedly bringing these debates up over and over again so that we have to defend that this concept even existed or defend how it was recovered in the 1990s or other things like that. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that point as part yeah. of the history here. Right. Now, I think with that, because Rob Hand was um, stated as being the primary promoter of whole sign houses in the talk, that he took it up and turned it into an issue. Well, he just, he said, right. he, wrote, he wrote a book saying, right. titled Whole Sign Houses, The Oldest System of House right, Division. Right, right. But um, I just want to share a story about Rob that has to do with this notion of um, things being decided from the beginning as not actually being the case. And that I attended a conference, and I'm thinking it had to be somewhere in the mid to later 1990s. Probably, I, my best guess is around 1996 um, or so. And that Rob gave a lecture on um, aspects that I, a Hellenistic view of aspects, and I attended it. And he was going on about the hurling of rays and the striking of rays and. Um, other aspect concepts. And afterwards, I went up to him and I said, Rob, you know, to tell you the truth, I didn't understand anything you said. Um, what does it all really mean? Um, what I'd like to know is how to use this material in interpretation. And you didn't like mention that at all. And he looked at me kind of with this surprised look on his face, um, like, don't you understand what we're doing here? And he said, we don't know what it means yet. Our job at this point is simply to translate the text and present our findings. That's what the subscription is for, to allow us to translate the text and present our findings. Once we have translated 
and studied a sufficient amount of material, then it will take some time to articulate a system and interpretations. So I thought that was like a very important statement that should go into the record of what it is they were doing and the way that they were proceeding and that they had not decided it from the beginning. And then in looking at Rob's um, comments on Holstein houses over the course of the period in 1993, when Paulus came out and there was, and you said something about that earlier, the use of Holstein houses um, was mentioned as the signs themselves as counted from the rising sign each sign counted as a place. It was simply stated in a sentence or two without much more commentary. In Paulus? In Paulus. Do you want me to share that? I have it. Do you, you know, know? Would you know where it is? Can you? Um. Yeah. Here. Just. It's just okay. the. If I'm. If I know what you're asking correctly, it's just the introduction to Paulus, and it's yeah. on the very first page yeah. that Rob Hand wrote in the um, third paragraph. It says, Paulus's astrology is a mature horoscopic astrology with most of the features of contemporary Western astrology, signs, aspects, directions, transits, rulerships, dignities, etc. But it's also an astrology that's still developing. Almost every one of Paulus's techniques has a form that ranges from somewhat different to very different indeed from their modern counterpoints. Some of the techniques are closer to those of the Indian Western tradition, for example, houses in Paulus are not a 12-fold division of the local sphere as they are most systems of modern Western astrology. Houses for Paulus are not even a category separate from the signs. Houses are simply the signs themselves mm -hmm. counted from the sign rising or horoscopos as the first place. Um, as the, first place. Mm -hmm. the other signs follow as places in the normal order. The first house extends from the first degree of the rising sign to the last degree, the second house or place likewise, and so forth, although Paulus does also refer to the actual degree of the ascendant as well. This system is often referred to as whole sign houses or the sign as house system and is used in India to this day. Um, yeah, and then he actually mentioned something about the Indian tradition and says yeah. a horoscope so, so constituted is called a Rashi chakra in Indian astrology to distinguish it from a chart drawn with houses, as we know them in the West, the Bhava Chalitra. Um, and then, yeah. Okay. So. Right. So then a year later in 1994, in um, Valens 2, part one, in the introduction, Rob wrote, that the whole sign houses is a powerful system in its own right. And he was not exactly advocating that modern astrologers stop using quadrant systems, but he thought that they should pay more attention to this old, simple, and efficacious system. Okay. Then it was not until 2000 that he wrote his book, Whole sign houses, the oldest house system in the world, seven years after whole sign houses were supposedly fa were found, first found in Hellenistic texts. So Rob also had this process of um, developing his position and understanding of whole sign houses. It wasn't a done deal from the very first moment before they even published anything. Right. Yeah, that's a really important point. And also, um, there, there's a statement basically, Holding says at some point that they're not taking into account that there's quadrant houses in Valens, or they're not taking into account that there's equal houses, but um, that's not true. Like in book three of Valens, when they translated book three of Valens, they talk about it when, and they have commentary when Valens introduces um, the quadrant house system. Yeah. Um, Chris, I have to stop for a moment. Okay. I'm sorry for that interruption. No problem. Okay. All right. So, um, oh yeah, we were just talking about how 
you know, when they got to book three of Valens, they talked about his quadrant house system. And then in 1996, um, in the introduction to Ptolemy in book three of Ptolemy, when they get to Ptolemy introducing equal houses, Schmidt wrote like a full essay about the different systems of house division and what mm -hmm. their current thinking was um, and, and citing the different authors who are using different things of like whole sign quadrant or yeah. equal in that. So it's like there was an open discussion and attempt to analyze all these different things. It's just that the conclusions that they were coming to weren't ones that everybody liked. So um, you said that Rob published that Whole Sign House is the oldest system of house division in 2000, and then he mm -hmm. also published uh, an academic paper in 2007. Right. That right. was uh, re el both elaboration and revision and refinement of some of the material that he had written about in the Whole Sign House book. And so he was continuing to develop his understanding and present his arguments. And again, that shows that it wasn't like this one singular factor was decided as a selling point for a product before the project began and remained static from that point on. Yeah, one well, one of the things I remember all I realize now in retrospect also mm -hmm. about that two seven two thousand seven paper, that's the one where he goes through and like counts up the different charts in order yeah. to demonstrate and and substantiate in an academic context that mm -hmm. Holstein houses was the most um, popular system in the Hellenistic tradition, and I'm sure that he was trying to do that both in order to bring attention in the academic community to Holstein houses existing, but he was also probably doing that partially in reaction to push back against the idea that Holstein houses existed or was popular because a large part of that paper is just substantiating that claim, mm -hmm. which in the Holstein houses pamphlet wasn't substantiated as conclusively, even though he did show example charts and, and cite mm -hmm. evidence. Right. I guess, um, one final thing I, I'd like us to remember was in the, um, you can find it in the paper that Schmidt wrote in 2016 on the houses where he's looking to the equal house system. And you might help me recapitulate that, that he says near in his, near the point where he begins his conclusion that notwithstanding all that he's talking about, most of the charts and balance were cast in the equal house system. In the whole sign house system. The, you're right, in the whole sign house system. Right. Um, and so, again, Schmidt himself is in the process of developing his ideas, but in the course of that, he acknowledged that even if Valens had changed his mind later on in life, which it has, that has its own set of complications because book nine is not necessarily in chronological order, but contains pieces left over from, that can be dated to earlier time periods. Yeah. But, but he... But as he's like looking at that, he is also saying, even if Valens did come to this conclusion at the end of his life, nevertheless, all the work that he, all the examples he gave during the first eight books were based on whole sign houses. Yeah, because Schmidt did, um, one of the things that's being emphasized or overemphasized at yeah. this point is this notion that Schmidt changed his mind at the end of his life yeah. about house division and holding is trying to pr portray it as if he came around to her side. Um, and actually one of the things I'll never forget about that is that when Schmidt died, she posted a post on Facebook kind of referring back to their house division debates and kind of gl almost gloating about the idea that Schmidt had come around to a position closer to hers before he died, which knowing the context of their previous debates and how much they just didn't like each other, 
really never sat sat well with me at all. Um, but to clear and to clarify exactly what happened with Schmidt is that for many years he said that only whole sign houses were used for topics and quadrant houses were used for dynamic strength or determining mm -hmm. how busy a planet is. And you can see him outline this original speculation or observation in his mm -hmm. translation of Book Three of Ptolemy in 1996. Um, but then what happened at the end of his life is he released that house division workshop in the summer of in June of 2016. And he released it partially in response to me and holding having our debate back in November of 2015. Mm -hmm. And in that workshop, he says that he finally figured out what to do with equal houses and that equal houses should be integrated on top of whole sign houses for the purpose of topics. Mm -hmm. But he still said that quadrant houses, in his opinion or view, were never meant to be used for topics and were only for dynamic purposes, which means that he never actually came around to Holdings' viewpoint as much as it's sort of being portrayed. Like she still ultimately would fundamentally disagree with that position that mm -hmm. quadrant houses aren't used to assign different areas of life. Um, and, and that despite some of his later comments, Schmidt himself um, recognized that whole sign houses were still used as one of the major systems of mm -hmm. house division. Yeah, so... All right. Um, I think we're at the sort of final point right, that you wanted. Right. To... Right. I just wanted to clarify clarify one more point that's out there in the um, uh, Twitter record, um, and that in um, Norwalk of uh, 2022 last year, um, Wade Caves, who has been my friend over the years, and we've exchanged communications and conversations about looking at the techniques and the different systems. Um, and there are a few places where he helped me understand certain concepts. So I want to acknowledge that. And as a courtesy, he told me of his long-term plan to dismantle um, whole sign houses. And my response to him was that um, I said, wait, I don't really care what kind of house system you use. I said, what I care about is that you do good astrology and let the success of your work stand on its own merit rather than on destroying the work of others. And he um, interpreted that as my endorsing quadrant house systems and communicated that on a Twitter post at some point a number of months ago, probably in the fall, if I recall. And um, I'm generally not on social media, but when that was brought to my attention, I contacted Wade and I said, wait, wait a second, like, you know, that's not what I said to you. And can you correct what I actually, so that it's in the record that that's not what I meant. And Wade was open to making the correction, but because he said of problems with one list being shut down that he didn't have access to, and that my response was too many words to go on Twitter, the full import of what I wanted to say never actually got out there. So for just for those people who may have come across um, the quote that I endorse quadrant health systems or Wade's use of them. I just you, want to. It's not that you don't endorse quadrant house systems. It's that you don't endorse a war on whole sign houses to destroy or just dis, dis, quote unquote dismantle it. Yes. And what I wanted to say is I think that in conclusion to this, that my main concern is that um, we as astrologers can best serve the astrological community and the entire like discipline tradition of astrology if we do the very best we can with the approach that we have been called to and we present those teachings with clarity and good solid foundations and cohesiveness and integration and we give 
good astrology to the community rather than using our creative energy to attack and destroy each other. And this is like what my hope is for how we can be of service to the tradition. Yeah. Um, I hope we can move past this at some point as well. I mm -hmm. hope this is like a final point in terms of um, needing to push back against certain things, but also airing things out because I do think in the Hellenistic and medieval traditions, like I said, they were trying to synthesize the different systems and trying to find ways to use them together. And, you know, even if a person doesn't want to do that or doesn't want to use different systems or doesn't prefer yeah. them, we don't have to be um, at each other's throats about exactly. this stuff. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that, so. yeah, we move astrology along by doing good astrology. Right. All right. So not a modern, not a modern invention existed in ancient astrology. Everybody should get along. Um, any other final thoughts uh, before we wrap up? I'm trying to think of anything we missed. I know there was obvious, there was obviously actually a lot, and I think I might still do a follow up to this. Yeah, no, I was, yeah, I was expecting that you would do a follow up with some of the, um, examples we saw in the text over the course of um, the tradition. There's a huge amount of additional um, evidence that can be provided of the um, continuation of whole sign houses in the Arabic and even into the Renaissance tradition. Um, that That is important. But what I wanted to do in this session here is primarily share the memories I had about what I saw and how I experienced it firsthand and to give testimony to that and fill in pieces of our um, oral history of the beginnings of Project Hindsight. And in the end to you know acknowledge the groundbreaking work that Schmidt did that without what he did, like none of us would be doing what we're doing now. And he did provide that foundation for um, much of the understanding of Hellenistic astrology that's ensued in the last 25 years. And so I want to honor one's teachers. Yeah, I really appreciate that um, because I feel like the story of Project Hindsight hasn't been fully told because we've both just, you know, we focused on on both of us publishing our books and doing mm -hmm. our final, our takes on Hellenistic astrology as best as we could over the past decade or, or so. Mm -hmm. um, but collecting some of those stories about Project Hindsight is important because a lot of the people aren't around anymore to tell those stories. And um, yeah, and it's it might be time to tell some of those stories because there are different nuances. It's like there's Except, different nuances. Yeah. You know, it was a really complicated thing. Right, a right. Lot of, a lot of good things. There were some challenging things. There were yeah. some bad things. But um, getting a neutral sort of historical analysis of that that's accurate based on our our experience of being there in person I think is important and now maybe we can tell some of that other parts of that story or the broader story someday mm -hmm. yeah all right well thanks a lot for for doing okay. this with me okay thank you Chris okay